Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be back with you uh, once again after the Easter break. I hope that uh, Easter was a good experience for all of you in spite of the um, sort of the terrible situation that we're all facing uh, these days. Um, I wanted just to let you know, uh, <clears throat> today we begin our study of Flannery O'Connor and her uh, short stories. And I'm assuming that all of you have located those stories in your packet, your syllabus packet, packet that all of you have. And uh, our first uh, story that we're going to sort of take up today is the uh, story that's entitled The Displaced Person. But I would like to ask you to have read for Friday's class two additional stories. The first would be Greenleaf, and the second will be Everything That Rises Must Converge. And we'll consider those two stories on Friday. Uh, we'll, uh, as I say, I'll try to cover pretty much um, the displaced person today, uh, this morning's class. And then on Friday morning, uh, we'll take a look at these other two. And then we just have, I think, a couple of other stories left, two or three others left. And we'll take those next week. So uh, what I want to ask you, uh, particularly about this morning's study, that is the, the displaced person, is um, what was your original response to the story, having read it? And I think... Uh, if I remember correctly, that most of you have not read any of Flannery O'Connor. And she can be a bit of a surprise, <laughs> I think, to people who are just reading her for the first time. I've, I've experienced that, uh, particularly in my literature classes, when I use her more frequently, um, and less so in religious studies. But what I'd like to ask you to consider is, first of all, what was your uh, original, your immediate response to the stories? Did you find them uh, repulsive? Were, were you intrigued? Were you taken in by it? What was it about the story? How did you react to it? So if you keep that little note in mind. And the second of the four questions that I'm going to ask you is, uh, what did you discover about each of the characters? Now, remember, one of the principal characters in the story is Mr. Guzak. He is the uh, emigrant from Poland, and with him is his wife and his two children, Rudolf, the 14-year-old boy, and Sedgwick, the 9-year-old uh, daughter. And then the other character is Mrs. McIntyre. She's the woman who is the owner of the dairy farm that all of this takes place, where all of this takes place. And then uh, she has hired uh, a couple, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Shortly. And Mr. Shortly is the dairy man. He's the one that milks the cows for her three times a day. And then his wife is there. I'm not quite sure what she does. She's more like a companion to Mrs. McIntyre, the owner of the place. And they have three children, uh, two daughters, who are, uh, don't come across very nicely in terms of the mother's description of them, and also they have a son who is away at Bible school, and he's going to, be, he's going to get himself uh, a parish and a, and a church, as we're told. And then uh, there are the two African Americans. There is the, uh, the older uh, gentleman, uh, Astor, um, and then there is the young boy, Sulk. And then the last of the characters in the story is Father Flynn, the Irish priest, with the very heavy brogue, Irish brogue that he has. He's oftentimes described as a sort of, um, you'll see the way it's written, he sort of rolls his R's, and so typically Irish. So they're the characters. And so what I want you to consider is what is, do you discover about each of the characters? as you met them and you encounter them in the story. And the third question is, um, from what point of view is the story being told? I'd like to have you think about that. Who's really telling the story? Uh, where are we getting our information? Who is the uh, sort of the heaviest uh, narrator in, in, the, in the tale itself? And then uh, finally, the fourth and the last question I want you to consider is, um, 
who is the displaced person? And then why do you think so? Obviously, that's the title of this, the story itself. So who is the displaced, displaced person in this particular story? Okay, so try to have those um, prepared and uh, we'll, um, we'll come back to those uh, uh, maybe, if not later in this morning's class, we'll certainly come back to it on Friday to begin with. I thought I would just very briefly give you a very, just a snapshot view of the author of our studies of these short stories, that is Flannery O'Connor. Um, and what's interesting about O'Connor is that she's probably amongst um, all of the American writers one of the best. And I've heard this from critics and from others that some of our very best literature, American literature, comes out of the South, like Faulkner and uh, others. Uh, and Flannery O'Connor is sure, certainly at the top of it. She's a highly gifted writer. And what's interesting about O'Connor is that she uh, has this uh, ability to put you uh, into the situation. You're like you're actually right there uh, with the characters and with the environment that she uh, expresses in her short stories. Another interesting aspect of O'Connor is that uh, so much of what she writes and the characters that she writes about are uh, people that she knew, uh, people from the village, people on her mother's farm. Uh, she uh, basically, the last part of her life, she, as you probably know, uh, if I remember mentioning this to you in class, that she had, uh, she suffered from the disease of lupus. And it's, um, the word lupus comes from the word wolf. Um, and as the wolf devours its prey, so this disease, this lupus disease, has a way of devouring the innards of the victims who have, who are victims of lupus. And she was, uh, she, she inherited that disease from her father, and so she died at a very young age. I think she was just 39 years of age when she died. Um, and uh, there's no telling how many more wonderful stories she could have written and told as she did, as she had not that disease. Um, so, um, what's another aspect of all of this is that O'Connor um, uh, writes about the things that she's um, that she's familiar with. Now, keeping in mind, she uh, returned at the age of I think thirty, came back to her mother's farm. It was known as the Andalusia. It was a a farm in Middlesville. And it was a 400-acre dairy farm, and uh, she lived and she wrote most of her short stories in that last eight or nine years of her life as she returned. And she came back to the mother's uh, farm because she wasn't capable of managing on her own any longer. So her mother took care of her uh, in so many ways. Um, so uh, just to give you an example, on page 196 of the text, uh, we we read the, this account here. Um, uh, this was the kind of thing that was happening. This is Mrs. Shortley's reflections. She says, uh, this is the kind of thing that's been happening every day in Europe. And she's talking about the war in Europe and the results of the war, uh, where they had not advanced as in this country. And watching from her vantage point, Mrs. Shortley had the sudden intuition that the gobbledygooks, that's what she called the, uh, the new um, farmhands, the uh, Guzaks, they're like rats with typhoid fleas, could have carried all these murderous ways over the waters with them uh, to this place here. So um, she, um, the, the mother had actually hired um, some em a couple of immigrants, a husband and wife team, they had a couple of children, very much like the, the uh, Guzaks. And, um, and she could hear the uh, dairyman's wife criticizing these um, this new newcomers, these newcomers. And so, so much of what we read in this particular text, she's quoting directly from uh, the farm hands that her mother had hired. So there's a lot of autobiographical material in here as, as well. Um, also, you'll notice Aster is the um, was the uh, the older of the two African Americans in the story, and uh, there was a eighty six year old African American uh, 
that had been on her mother's farm for years, something like 35 or 40 years he was there. He was quite elderly, and so he stayed on. He had a small little place on the farm. And Flannery was personally very close to him. She really, uh, she was very close and he was very kind to her. So she was very sympathetic and very, uh, it was like, a, he was like a kind of a grandfather to her. And you'll notice um, at the end uh, of the story on page 234, um, um, this is when, um, at the very end, when Mr. Guzak is under the tractor and the tractor starts to roll back and in the barn is Mrs. McIntyre, the owner of the farm, and then Mr. Shortley, and then the young African-American sulk. And so this is what we hear. And so uh, Mr. Shortley turned his head at, with incredible slowness and stared uh, silently over, the sh over his shoulder. And that uh, uh, she had, this is Mrs. McIntyre, and she had started to shout to the displaced person, but that she had not. She had felt her eyes and Mr. Shortley's eyes and the Negro's eyes come together in one look that froze them in collusion forever. And she had heard the little noise the pole made at, as the tractor wheel broke his backbone. The two men ran forward to help and she fainted. Uh, that, that's the scene where Mr. Guzak um, is, is killed by the, the tractor roll, rolling over him. And there was an incident that happened uh, on a neighboring farm, something similar to that. And so she's borrowing that incident. But what's kind of interesting is that you'll notice all the characters there, and eventually the priest comes and brings communion to the dying man, uh, Mr. Guzak. But, um, but the only one that's not there is, um, is the, uh, the older uh, African-American, Aster. And she kept him out of that story, out of that scene, because of her love for him and did not want him to be part of that collusion that what apparently is, uh, uh, you get the suggestion that uh, they, were, they could have stopped this and they could have been prevented, but they didn't, they kept silent. Uh, also, um, you'll notice that um, there's a lot of, um, Flannery O'Connor had when she went returned back to the farm, she had a lot of peacocks and ducks and chickens and swans and pigeons, and she raised them, and she seemed to have had a close affiliation with these, with these, uh, these ducks and these birds, as it were. Uh, she had personal names for each one of them. And uh, what's interesting about the um, about the peacock, as you can see the picture on your on your um, uh, collection or on your text, if you have the book itself, the um, the peacock is the symbol of immortality and the incorruptible soul. So, um, and what's so fascinating about the story is that as we uh, as we walk through the days uh, with Mrs. McIntyre. She's trying to get rid of the peacock. She's trying to dis she's she has somehow managed to get rid and destroyed all the peacocks. There's only one left, and it's the peacock that's following Mrs. Shortley around and also following Mrs. McIntyre. And the only one that has any sense of um, compassion and uh, identity or relationship with the peacock is Father Flynn, the Irish priest who comes and brings, as you see at the end, there's just one peacock left at the end of the story, and he brings them breadcrumbs to the peacocks, and he admires them, and, and, and uh, there's this also, you'll also notice in the peacock feathers are these, these eyes, and they are symbolic perhaps with the eyes of God, um, and the sun is also somehow reflected in the peacock itself. So the peacock uh, stands as a symbol of immortality, and the incorruptible soul. Another a story that we'll be reading next week, and that is Good Country People. And in that story, uh, you, we, we will meet a, um, a, a 35 or 36-year-old uh, woman by the name of Joy, uh, who changed her name from Joy to Hulga to annoy her mother. Um, and uh, she had but one leg, uh, 
Her leg got blown off in a hunting accident with her father years ago. She also has a PhD in philosophy. And, um, and so in some ways, uh, Joy Hulga is uh, an image of Flannery O'Connor herself, for she herself uh, was uh, not healthy. She was dying basically from the, uh, from the disease of um, lupus. And uh, there's also in that story, you'll recall, um, a Bible salesman comes to the, to the house and Joy Hulga and her mother uh, are there and he knocks on the door and he eventually comes in and has a dinner with them. But he also uh, romances her. And then eventually, as you'll discuss, I'm not gonna tell you the end of the story, but he um, romance, uh, romances her and at the end he leaves. Uh, in Flannery O'Connor's own life story, um, she was very much in love with a Swedish um, scholar, a young handsome man from Sweden. His name was Eric, and I can't remember his surname, the last name. But um, he, um, he was selling uh, textbooks for Holt Reinhardt Publishing House, and he came by and he would go by to see her frequently, and she was very much in love with him, and she thought he was in love with her as well. But, um, uh, but uh, in the end, he returns to Sweden, and she finds out he married somebody back home in Sweden. So she was devastated by that. And so you'll see it when you come to read the end of uh, the uh, story, Good Country People, the relationship that Joy Hulga had with the Bible salesman. There was a kind of a similarity. So I'm just pointing uh, some of these things out because they are, to some extent, uh, autobiographical, so much of what she writes about. And what's uh, fascinating about uh, O'Connor is that if you ever go to Middlesville, uh, her, the town where the mother's uh, farm was located and where she spent so much of her, the last part of her years, uh, uh, I, uh, one of my cousins years ago uh, traveled, to, uh, he, was, uh, he was down in, um, actually in Atlanta, Georgia, and then he went uh, to Middlesbridge um, uh, to see the O'Connor, thinking there'd be a, a, a shrine or something there, but nobody in the town recognized her, what gave her any sort of recognition, and they were basically angry with her because so many of the characters in her story were actually people from the town and the villages, so uh, so they're not very happy with O'Connor. So you won't find any memorials or um, sort of uh, um, uh, somehow state-preserved um, historical sites on O'Connor, at least in her hometown. Um, there is a, another uh, aspect of reading O'Connor that I wanted to sort of point out to you, and that is um, she has what is known as the anagogical vision, that's A-N-A-G-O-G-I-C-A-L, anagogical vision. The word anagog comes from the Greek meaning to climb or to ascend upwards. Um, uh, above is another, uh, so, so writing with an anagogical vision is a method a writer has for spiritual interpretation. In other words, it is the technique a writer uses to interpret words, statements, and events that suggest something above or beyond the literal meaning. And it's really important for each of you when you read O'Connor is to keep that in mind that she's always writing with this anagogical vision. Um, and just to give you um, a couple of uh, very brief examples, and uh, I think you probably have the same page numbers. On page 194, um, you have uh, the account of, um, you no, know, the arrival of the Guzaks coming to Mrs. McIntyre's farm. And then we hear uh, uh, Mrs. Shortly was watching. She's the, uh, she's the wife of the dairy man, and uh, she's keeping an eye on what's happening. So she says, uh, so Mrs. Shortley was watching the black car turn through the gate from the highway over by the tool shed 
about 15 feet away, the two Negroes, Aster and Selk, had stopped work to watch. They were hidden by a mulberry tree, but Mrs. Shortley knew they were there. Now, again, here is an example of this anagogical vision. The mulberry tree um, is, um, is a, a very symbolic tree, and she uses it in several of her stories. If you've read A Good Man is Hard to Find, one of the very most um, oftentimes uh, published work, you find them in most American anthology texts. But uh, the mulberry tree is important because um, the mulberry uh, itself from the tree is the very last to uh, bear fruit. And the reason is that they hold out against the severity of the winter, the ice, and the storms. They had that ability, the mulberry tree, to hold out and not come forth. And it was they stay hidden. Uh, it's also, the mulberry tree is also a symbol of, um, of strangers in a foreign land. And if, isn't that the truth with the, our African-American brothers and sisters? And uh, what our history, especially in this country, says about the treatment of African-Americans, um, that they um, have had to stay sort of hidden, as it were. And so, uh, so that, that little incident about Mrs. Shortley noticing uh, both uh, Astor and Sulk hiding behind the mulberry tree is, uh, is part of that anagogical vision. Um, another example of, uh, of Flannery O'Connor's use of the anagogical vision is the scene after um, Mr. Guzak is killed by the, uh, the tractor rolling over him. And, um, and then um, later, uh, who returns to the farm but Mr. Shortley. And, um, and um, as he comes back, uh, he, this is the way he's described, you see, on page 227. Uh, Mr. Shortley stood there alone. He returns and he goes to Mrs. McIntyre's front door, knocks on the door, and um, he had on a black felt hat and a shirt with red and blue palm trees designed in it, but the hollows in his long, bitten, blistered face were deeper than they had been a month ago. Well, she said, where is Mrs. Shortley? Now remember, the Shortleys left when Mrs. Shortley overheard uh, Mrs. McIntyre saying she was going to uh, get rid of the Shortleys. So in the middle of the night, she packed everything up, she and Mr. Shortley and the two daughters, and off they went. And in the, in the meantime, as they were driving out, Mrs. Shortley has a, has a stroke or a heart attack and dies in the car. So this is some time later, probably a year or two later, he comes back. And so he arrives wearing the, um, the shirt with the palm trees on it. And then Mrs. Uh, McIntyre says, well, well, where is Mrs. Shortley? And Mr. Shortley didn't say anything. The change in his face seemed to have come from the inside. He looked like a man who had gone for a long time without water. She was God's own angel, he said in a loud voice. She was the sweetest woman in the world. Well, where is she, Mrs. McIntyre murmured. Dead, he said. She had herself a stroke on the day she left out of here. There was a corpse-like composure about his face. I figured, he said, that the pole killed her. Uh, she seen through him from the very first. She known he was come from the devil. She told me so. So... What's interesting about this is that the, the allusion to the desert, uh, a place without water, um, is a symbol uh, from, um, I think, borrowed from Flannery O'Connor's sort of uh, profound understanding of the scripture, where Jesus encounters the, uh, the devil in the desert. And so uh, suddenly Mr. Shortly takes on this appearance of an evil figure. And we see it again, uh, repeated several times since his return. Um, uh, when Mrs. Um, McIntyre goes to the barn, she notices this sort of snake-like serpent figure. 
and that was a reference to Mr. Shortley. And also there is a, a reference to, uh, to his coming back and, uh, for example, on page uh, 228, um, he could tell her the truth about this, uh, that if she let him go, the three years he would own his own house, have a television aerial set up on top of it as a matter of policy. Mr. Shirley began to come to her back door every evening to put certain facts before her. There is again the sort of the evil temptation of trying to convince Mrs. Um, Shortley of the evil of the these visiting. So, so there's so, so many uh, references. Um, I, I won't read any more directly from here, but uh, from the text itself. But again, the uh, 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 one of the. Um, um, one of the um, very brief, uh, let's see on page, just 217 for a minute. Uh, when um, uh, Mrs. Uh, McIntyre says, um, what you colored people don't realize, she said, is that I'm the one around here who holds all the strings together. If you don't work, I don't make any money and I can't pay you. You're all dependent on me. And if you remember, that when we were studying the uh, creation accounts, the first two chapters of the book of Genesis, um, the notion that Eve eating from the tree of knowledge, uh, she does so uh, with the intent of knowing all things. And knowing all things, there would be no need to, uh, to be dependent upon any but herself, a, a sense, the sin of self-sufficiency. Uh, they somehow... The, the the idea that I am totally independent of anything beyond myself, and she sort of expresses that that's that that sin that what we call the original sin, the striking out um, on oneself, um, uh, being totally self sufficient, that uh, beyond me I needed no one. So you have you have these uh, various examples. Uh, also, if you remember one of the visions. That uh, that I think this is shortly has is the vision of the um, the fish and the sun. And again, the the fish is a symbol of Christ, and she sees in the distance the image of um, of the fish along the shore. Many of them, again, suggesting that it was an opportunity for her, an opportunity of grace that she um, that she doesn't accept. So, so, uh, so when you're reading O'Connor's stories, keep looking for these various uh, sort of symbols that are beyond the literal meaning. Um, and uh, she, was, uh, she was deeply uh, sort of um, knowledgeable of the Bible, and she uses a lot of biblical sort of ideas and uh, biblical references in describing various events and uh, characters in her stories. Um, there's so many. Uh, an, another uh, aspect of the story that I want you to keep in mind is that there are so many, many examples of uh, racial and cultural prejudice uh, throughout the stories. Um, on page uh, 196, just to give you an example, uh, she talks about um, uh, this. Uh, this is. Um, the, the, the um, illogic of Negro thinking always irked Mrs. Shortly. They ain't uh, where they belong to be, she said. They belong to be back over yonder where everything is still like they had been used to. Over here it's more advanced than where they came from. But y'all better look out now, she said, and nodding her head. Uh, there's about 10 million billion more just like them, and I know uh, what Mrs. McIntyre said. In other words, um, what Mrs. Shortley is suggesting is that the African-American, the two, uh, Astor and uh, Sulk, don't belong here. And she's basically telling them, go back to your own home, as she is doing with the Guzaks. And she's exaggerating. So the, the, uh, the, the, the text itself is, is, is just is full of prejudice and... Uh, narrow-mindedness and gullibility, especially racial and cultural prejudice. Let's see if I have one other example of that. Um, 
Uh, oh, this is when um, Mrs. Um, McIntyre discovers Selk uh, has a photograph of this young woman from Poland who is now in a concentration camp, and it happens to be the cousin of Mr. Guzak. So Mr. Guzak, Guzak in, in, uh, out of compassion for his cousin, uh, the only way he could bring the cousin to this country is if um, uh, uh, it was, there was a marriage proposal. So he gives Selk a photograph of the cousin and, um, and, um, and Selk is paying Mr. Guzak so much out of his salary each month in order to, to have enough money to send for his cousin who was in a concentration camp. And so, um, so you have uh, this expression here. Then Mrs. McIntyre catches uh, the, um, the young boy with the photograph and she pulls it out of his hands and asks what this is all about. And then, um, uh, then she uh, stepped back and said, Mr. Guzak, you would bring this poor, innocent child over here and try to marry her off to a half-witted, thieving, black-stinking nigger. What kind of a monster are you? Um, well, as we can detect in reading this story, it was Mr. Uh, Guzak that was doing this out of compassion. He's the one that did not recognize the distinction of the racial prejudice that existed in this country, most especially at this time. And so he thought he was doing a good deed by bringing his, by um, having this arrangement with uh, this young um, Selk and his cousin uh, who was in a concentration camp in, in Poland. Um, so the, again, uh, I, it's, um, it, can be, uh, it can be unnerving just reading the stories and, uh, and discovering the, uh, the lack of compassion that so many of the uh, characters had. And it would have been, have been very, very typical of, um, of that time that racial prejudice and, um, and it's kind of my country, right or wrong, my country. You see it when Mrs. Uh, uh, Shortly is constantly criticizing the priest, Father, um, uh, Father Flynn, the Irish priest, um, because um, she keeps talking about the uh, Catholic religion in Europe uh, as opposed to the... Uh, um, sort of the fundamentalist um, Protestant uh, um, religion uh, today, and she refers to it as it's been updated and it's, uh, it's relevant, but the old outdated uh, faith of the uh, church, um, uh, so she was very much, again, culturally, religiously, racially prejudiced. So a lot of that pervades the stories that we have before us. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the last uh, little uh, sort of um, reference I wanted to, to share with you is this um, account or this uh, notion of illuminating grace. And the idea of, of, the, of this grace is essentially it's a gift that is given freely by God and it's designed to enlighten the minds of uh, the recipient, of men and women, to help them toward a healthier, more positive life, and ultimately, life eternally. So it, it's a gift that's given, and it's given freely and generously by God. It's a gift of enlightenment, is what a best way to put it. And, it, uh, and so many writers, or religious writers, speak of this in different terminology. The, the gift is oftentimes um, received in various ways. For example, uh, one could be overwhelmed by the beauty of the sunset or the beauty of the ocean or the wonders of nature and suddenly become aware of, the, uh, of, the, of God's presence and that beauty. And in some ways, grace is received that way. We recognize that the, uh, our relationship with, with God is in various forms. Uh, or it could be if we heard an inspiring talk or something that illumined our sort of sensibilities, that sense of uh, awareness 
of the presence of God in the, in the world around us. Um, it's, um, um, again, um, it's a supernatural aid allowing one insight into one's relationship with the divine scheme of things, basically. So um, it's, it's a gift that can be either accepted or rejected. And you will notice in reading uh, the stories of Flannery O'Connor that so many of her characters, especially those characters that are prejudiced, that are narrow-minded, that are gullible, that are full of hatred and racial, cultural, religious hatred, they're all given the gift, the opportunity of giving the gift of grace. And so what you have to watch is whether they accept that gift of grace, that illuminating grace, or they reject it. And it comes in various forms. It oftentimes comes through violent means. So, uh, so uh, I oftentimes think uh, in my own sort of career, I've worked in uh, numerous prisons, uh, both in England and here in this country. And so oftentimes I meet uh, individuals who are incarcerated, many of them for a lifetime, uh, for sort of violent crimes that are committed. And so oftentimes I find them uh, having somehow come to God in spite of the fact that they're imprisoned and that they're somehow their experience changed them. They, uh, it's, uh, I always think about O'Connor's gift of grace given to them and they've come to a, a peace and a reconciliation um, with, their, um, with, their, uh, with their life as, as uh, prisoners. And um, so, um, uh, so uh, I think what she's, uh, again, th this is part of her sort of her Catholic doctrine of grace, but she also says, uh, um, when we talk about free will, she said, well, everybody is born with, with this gift of free will, and, and each is free to accept or to reject God's gift of grace, that illuminating grace that enables us to live more fully and more truthfully and more in, uh, in an awareness of the presence of the holy around us. Um, in her stories, we look for the moment in which the presence of grace can be felt as it awaits to be accepted or to be rejected. Uh, um, and, and, and one thing that's really fascinating about O'Connor's stories is that she never brings judgment and she never says, oh, this person is a bad person or this person deserved what he or she received or this person, is a, she never seems to bring judgment. It's left to ourselves to see and to understand the character and whether or not that character has accepted that gift of grace. Uh, she also assumes as uh, uh, that, uh, that everyone is um, born with original sin. We all have inherited the sin of our first parents as we talked about earlier on in the semester when we were reading the creation accounts and especially chapter three of Genesis about the fall. All have inherited the original sin of Adam and Eve, and all are equally guilty. Thus, the tendency to not stand in a dialogical relationship uh, with God. There is that tendency of striking out for independence and self-sufficiency. Uh, many of her characters flee from the call of the divine, yet find themselves pursued by it, and finally forced to accept or to reject their call as children of God. Well, I think that's probably all for this morning's class, but um, I would uh, once again remind you, please have green leaf and everything that rises must converge uh, for, um, for Friday's uh, class. Um, and we'll talk, about, uh, we'll talk about those two and maybe sum up some of the um, uh, uh, thoughts we might have regarding the um, the, the story that we just finished, The Displaced Person. I'll be anxious to hear who you think is the displaced person in that story, okay? Uh, also, I hope you have a, a, a good rest of the day, and I hope that your parents and uh, your family and your loved ones are all safe and healthy, uh, and that we might get through this, uh, this terrible uh, virus uh, um, in a 
positive way. And uh, also uh, keep in your prayers and your thoughts uh, so many people who are suffering or losing their businesses and are afflicted with the disease itself. And um, I think our prayer and our thoughts can be so powerful in terms of keeping all of us together and keeping us healthy and positive. And um, I think um, think that I think it'll it'll all come out well. Anyway, uh, blessings to all of you, and uh, uh, keep reading. And um, we'll um, we'll be back together again on Friday. Thank you. Bye bye.